Hi there, welcome to Sharpen Word, and we are happy to have you with us today. And this is a one-to-one -one session where we basically chat with our invited guest, pick his brains, and hoping to get to know more about him as a person and not just as a, a writer. And today we have the pleasure of having an Italian writer with us. Thank okay. you very much. And uh, he is currently calling Penang his home, and he is also an underground, underground uh, punk heavy sorry metal punk guitarist. Yes. Sorry about that. Sorry. Blunder. <laughs> and uh, and before he turns to writing, he was actually a musician in the early part of his life, and he was traveling extensively in the Europe and the UK, and then there was a chance upon whereby he got an offer to teach Italian in China mm -hmm. and since then when he jumped on the bandwagon he has never looked back and since then he has also written two books and the one the latest was just published recently I believe yeah, Marco? 2015 in November yeah. okay and, uh, and now he's today here and let's hope we can have a good session with him the second book that mm -hmm. you've written yeah because it's very much related to yeah this, yeah uh, yeah metal exactly Scene, yeah? And the first Maybe. one, in a way, uh, it digs into something uh, the yeah. I'll tell you later. Please, yeah. please. Sorry. <laughs> so let's talk about your second book. Yeah. Okay, my second book is called uh, Banana Punk Rock Trace, Punk R-A-W-K, because it's not just punk rock, it's punk rock. You know, it's a, it's a mix of heavy metal punk, metal punk, which is what it's played in Malaysia and in Indonesia. Okay, so Banana Punk Rock Trace, uh, um, uh, a Euro full metal punk journey in uh, Malaysia, Borneo, and uh, Indonesia. Okay, I have, uh, since 2010, uh, I've been involved into the local music scene in Penang, playing guitar in this band called We Hot Scam, which means we express ourselves through skateboarding and music. I hate skateboarding but this band had this name already they they, <laughs> they have been playing for for a while and uh, they are one of the otai bands in penang otai means uh, old timer is uh, like a malay um, shortening to say like old time <laughs> um i was fortunate because i had uh, given up music because i told you i was sick of it you know i, I was sick of this uh, s kissing and s leaking because i can give you a gig you can give me these benefits book my band because later i will do this for you blah blah so, so, so to yeah. make it clear you actually bought with the politics of it but not the music right i even bought with the music because That's it well. all sounds the same <laughs> there's no originality in the music because people I believe they do not know music very well because but that they take your direction if you if you listen to punk I mean one thing that really pissed me off for the whole of my time in music is that if you are a punk rocker or a metalhead and you tell to your clique that you listen to if you are a punk and you tell to punks that you li listen to metal or vice versa they will tell you that you are stupid because punk is punk, metal is metal, and you cannot change, you cannot mix. But I mean, I can listen to the new Bomb Turks, and at the same time, I can listen to uh, Ike Turner or uh, Jimi Hendrix or uh, Blue Blue Oyster Cult or any of these bands from the '60s and the '70s or like psychedelic rock, uh, what, whatever because the music is bloody good you know and because if there was if we never had uh, this progression of music we would never add punk which was uh, some sort a rejection to this kind of music like metal was a rejection was an amplification of the concepts brought in by hard rock and like deep purple and stuff like that you know Heavy metal, the, 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 the term is a bit contested. Some, some people say that it's because William Barrocks, the writer of The Naked Lunch, wrote this story where there was a heavy metal kid from uh, Uranus. So heavy metal because of the, the, the chemical stuff, the chemistry. You know? So uh, 
it's all linked uh, together in a movement of uh, social change. But if people do not understand uh, the world, I mean, humans, I mean, you, you, you need to look uh, at the whole. You need to elevate yourself uh, to look from to, to the top of the city to understand how the cars are driving around the city, you know? Which means you cannot only close yourself in a box because that's not going to take you a a anywhere. And this is what I, I try to tell to writers also, because if you want to write science fiction, okay, you want to write science, science fiction and it's great, but if you only read the science fiction and you only abide to the stereotype of the genre and you only think that if you want to write cyberpunk you have to set your story in the future and this and that and the genre you will never be a good writer because you will just be yeah, the umpteenth person which copies a genre when i set out to write the second book uh, i i wrote it because nobody had written a story being a white person playing in a malaysian band so it's a tropical punk band there have been a few books uh, of research uh, and there, uh, there has been a book a uh, photographic book uh, called the labor of love and uh, and uh, and hate by these siblings from sweden uh, lina and uh, john uh, resbo which i know by correspondence so hi guys <laughs> and uh, Though nobody has ever made the experience of playing a first stand in a Malaysian band. So I thought this was uh, a book that deserved to be written. Anyhow, even if uh, it would not be a very successful book or anything, there was a gap. And I wanted to fill this gap because the book is not a history of the scene or anything. It's my history as a white man. So banana punk rock trace why because the banana pancake trail is a collection of destination in this route of this gap year students and especially from england and australia who come to southeast asia to essentially have the time of their life and banana pancake because when they go to places they cannot cope with the local food with the breakfast and stuff so the locals in order to lure these people and get their money and this happens in thailand in malaysia in cambodia indonesia wherever they adapt the local dishes to the taste of these people so that they can come and feel feel themselves at home and spend their money so that, that's why the banana pancake so since i'm white but i am treading along this path but just go and unearthing the unusual of the punk music and metal music scene. And I'm talking about uh, heavy metal Muslims, uh, uh, Kada Zanduzum punk rockers, um, playing so you in... So Kada Zanduzum punk rockers? Yeah. Okay. Skull cap toting Muslim death metal uh, scene, wh whatever. Interesting. Nazi, Malay power skinheads, I mean, all, all, all kind of these things. Nobody had really talked about them. And uh, I, of course, I don't know everything. I just wanted to give my perspective. So the book may not be liked by some people in the scene, but I personally don't care because that's my perspective. It's my travels. As a travel writer, it's a metal punk travel writing in this way. I describe my travels playing in a band and uh, uh, touring to find uh, all of the people all across Borneo and uh, in Indonesia because in 2014 June uh, I toured with We Are Scam that, that was their the first tour to Indonesia and we played Java and Bali so that's a part on that tour actually and uh, at the beginning of 2015 my band The Nerds Rock Inferno two of the three guys came here so we actually recruited a call from Soundmaker in uh, which is a club in Penang to play bass and we toured Malaysia with him we toured actually mm -hmm. after the band was uh, split up for 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 10 years actually. no no eight years because uh, 10 years would be next year sorry mm -hmm. so the book is a collection of experiences of this guy which came who came to malaysia with a very deep knowledge of the western metal punk scene some expectations and see how things work here 
how things develop here. And I have been playing with these people for five years, five, six years. Now we are not playing that much anymore. The band is still together though, but we don't really play much. And uh, I wanted to document this, uh, this experience. And the book comes with a CD also, so that I want to try to help uh, readers, because the, the book is not for the music scene people, the book is for people who don't know much about this. And they, hopefully, by reading this book, will get a better knowledge, and that they will get more interested, and they will give a chance to these bands. Yeah. Give them uh, insight, basically. Yeah. Yeah. I was surprised that the book was reviewed by the star, uh, which didn't review my first novel very well, but they reviewed this book very well by saying that the person who read it, she didn't know anything about the scene, and she said, if I didn't have a chance to read this book, I would have never known, and I would have never gotten I interested into this movement, and I would have never known that this is a positive movement that actually brings uh, some some change to the youth of my country. So my goal was just to put these bands and put these people on the map because I have to say, the scene is very good here. The scene is very organized. They have spaces, they have places. What they don't have is uh, speakers, spokespersons, people who take the time to take them out of the underground woodwork and put them in front of a wider audience yeah. because my my book uh, by actually being distributed in uh, mainstream shops i don't want to sell out and and honestly i don't care because writers from books they make so few money that even if i sold out i would probably earn uh, like 100 of it anyways is uh, uh, it's about uh, bringing these guys out of the woodwork and Show help uh, young yeah. people or older people or their parents to read about these stories yeah. actually, and, actually an, what's and have an understanding there, yeah. of it. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. I didn't know the first part of this first half of this interview ended up is more like a discourse about underground music. Yeah, in, uh, more or less. Because because <laughs> there's a lot of uh, misconceptions yeah. and uh, there uh, there is um, I mean uh, uh, not much has been written yet. Plus on the second side in order to be a full-time writer and in order to be in Mal Mal Malaysia for a few years, I had to uh, become a PhD student, actually, which my topic is, was actually studying this music scene. Uh, I, didn't, I did an ethnography of it, looking at uh, globalized influence, globalization and pre-existing markers of ethnic identity and how they play out in the performance of this music. Because Indians, Malays and Chinese, uh, they, they, they grab the same global influences but they play in different ways. The way the, the fabric of the, the lyrics and stuff is different, I mean they use different things. Okay. But I hope to be publishing that thesis soon so you will read the, the book okay. later. Yeah. You look forward to that? <laughs> I don't know, I think it would be a very boring uh, per, per process to sit down, take... Uh, now, is it because of the path that you are trading now that you actually was inspired to say that uh, now I want to bring danger back to literature? Is that what, because of uh, experience and the books I read and then the people that you face, mm -hmm. both from the people from the publishing industry mm -hmm. down to the readers themselves, mm -hmm that you are thinking that maybe, you know, this is what I am doing. Okay, know, try to think, try to think. Anything good happen in the history of art starts from danger, because danger, because the, the thing is recognized socially to be a problem for youth, even like punk music, heavy metal music, the moral panics against these musics, because they were in a way dangerous because they affect the establishment. So with my writing, I want to mine conventions, I want to destroy everything I can in my path because that's the only way to greatness, you know. Even in some ways, I mean, okay, if you think of uh, history, of course I'm not a Nazi or anything, but 
people like Hitler, people like this Mao, Stalin, whatever, they did evil things against mankind and they are part of the history that prob 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 probably better remember than people who did good things. Good things yeah. So an element of danger needs to be there if you want to be remembered in some ways, which does, doesn't mean that I'm trying to use uh, provocative themes just to be uh, more appreciated by, by readers, but I think that once you feel offended, disgust, once you feel that the book uh, is good but you don't like it for some way, something visceral that takes you down to the stomach and makes you think, that's when uh, you as an author, you have reached your point, which is inform, shock. Shock in a way, I mean, that you have to shake, them to shake people's yeah. minds, you know. In some ways, my publisher, the name, uh, Gerak Budaya, you know, Shake Culture, that's what I want to do with my, with my writing and uh, you see danger can be the danger of a choice like I mean uh, writing a book on punk music in Malaysia is a commercial suicide because mm. the publisher how do I market this book I mean there is a niche yes but Mal Malaysia is a sub niche of a very small niche actually Micronies. So it was dangerous uh, e even for the publisher actually. I've been told that I think that the first print is uh, going to be finished very soon so hopefully my, my strategy works. And uh, in, in terms of uh, my fiction, and I mean, mean now I wrote one novel and a few short stories uh, for, for the anthologies of fiction of I, I am in uh, KL Noir Blue uh, PJ Confidential, uh, Lost in Putrajaya. I don't know, I try to use, uh, they, they, they want stories set in Malaysia and I try to set my stories in Malaysia being uh, really Malaysian stories with Malaysian character, Mal Malaysian feel, uh, what I see in this country. I, I just don't get the stereotypical horror or science fiction or uh, whatever steampunk story storyline and I put it all in the background of Kuala Lumpur. No. I recently wrote this story for PJ Confidential using two Malay black metallers that uh, get on top of the Amkor Mall to do a sacrifice to evoke uh, Satan actually. And uh, that's a very Malaysian story because I use Malays and I just like try to use local symbols like the Zamkor yeah. Mall and I use the, the immigrant uh, Nepali guard that finds them and stuff like that, Malay woman. And uh, yeah, you must do, do that. You must play around with your elements and uh, get them get them to be alive on the page with, uh, with a kick of danger because uh, danger is even for who's reading maybe can, can be offended by this thing. Okay. The first book, yeah. which I think it is not so much of a music scene related, right? Yeah, exactly. Maybe, but I would, rather than talk about the book, we should be doing it later in the, uh, in the second session. Maybe you should uh, share with us actually how, what inspired you to write that book? especially the, the scene of the story actually is in the Malaysia. And mm -hmm. I guess that was actually pretty controversial, isn't it? And if I'm not mistaken, it was actually uh, banned. Yeah. yeah, last year. Yeah, but that was uh, two years after it was released. Yeah, yeah. which is so ridiculous, but I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you should share something with us. Okay, so the question is a bit wide. I'll try to narrow it down to the essential. You asked me why I wrote this book. Okay, first. I wrote the book uh, more or less after three years after living in Malaysia. I have a partner which is a Chinese Malaysian, so I want to say that some, some people may think that I may have been biased and influenced by the view of my Chinese Malaysian girlfriend that you may meet later and I still don't know. <laughs> and uh, I say no because the music scene brought me 
to play with Malays, Indians, Eurasians, and a lot of other people, actually. And uh, I have friends, uh, multi-ethnic friends. Uh, I have uh, immigrant worker friends, which is something that most Malaysians tend not to have. So I kind of try to get very deep into the country because that's the, the nature of myself. I have an inquisitive nature and I want to explore things, see things the best I can. So, of course, uh, when you live in a country where you read the newspaper and probably maybe for propaganda reason or anything like, like that, but you have uh, the star and then you have all of those area metro and this and that where, you know, first page, Nigerian uh, neb with drugs, this and that. Drug mule uh, from Malaysia go to China, found with the uh, eggs uh, like inside of the body. She, she, she will be killed, she will be executed after an unjust trial, blah, 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 blah. And a uh, Nigerian scam, uh, Malaysian woman to fly to Australia with the same heroin in the stomach, blah, blah, blah. That was the, the, the cherry on top of the shit pile of the, the stories that I have uh, heard about Malaysia. And uh, I thought I had to do something. And uh, I, I really wanted to write a book. I, I, I had started, I had like just a few thousand words down, maybe like 10 pages, 15 pages, 20 pages. I went to, on a 10 months long uh, hitchhiking trip from Asia to Europe with my girlfriend Kit. And during this, this year, I decided I, I want to be a, a full-time writer. This was 2012 came back in uh, November, three days after we came back, we went to the Georgetown Festival, and I spoke with Amir Muhammad uh, saying, uh, because he was launching Fixie, which now is a popular Malaysian uh, independent, gone mainstream uh, publishing company of fiction. And I approached him and said, uh, and asked if he was interested in uh, English written books because he had uh, publish Malay written books and he was say and he said yes I'm launching fixing novel it will be English if you want to submit or something. So I literally every morning I would I would wake up at seven from seven to nine I would bash my keyboard for two hours without even looking at what I was writing and I wrote the book in uh, in 60 days a very f uh, raw first draft but it was finished I submit to him, uh, and then I submit also to Monsoon because he, he, publishing, I mean, is long. I mean, you, you always have to wait a lot of time. And I was impatient, so I started pitching the story to other publishers, and I thought that Singapore and publisher with distribution in the UK and stuff would have been better, so I went with Monsoon. And um, yeah, the book is not a book on the punk scene, but everyone, which is something that I don't understand if they read the book or not. When I talk with people, they say, oh, Nazi Goreng, yeah, the, the, is a punk book. No, it's not a bloody punk book. It's a book about Malaysia. And the protagonists are two subculture characters taken by chance from the punk scene because they exist, actually, these Malay power people, but it's totally a fictional thing. I, I had uh, very few inter interaction with Malay power people because it's very difficult to get to meet them. And when you talk with them, and I talk to some of them, I talk with a guy from Jugra and other people that I don't want to mention now because maybe they don't want to be mentioned. Uh, when you ask the important questions, so why you think like this, why you, they, they say that they, they, they cannot or they don't want to answer. So there's no way um, to have a, a conversation that can lead to, to understanding, yeah, you know? So I also think that this is a flaw of this movement, you know, that there's not really a aim a clear direction. in what they're doing, actually. And, uh, but this is a problem in many Malaysian things and not just political class. I mean, I'm talking about arts now. There's no di 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 direction in what they, they want to do because, I mean, if you play in a band and you want to sing in English, you probably want to go tour 
Europe or something. Very few bands do it actually. They don't have the courage to, to, to do it maybe or they don't. They say they, they don't have the money, but I mean, yeah, whatever. So the book is simply a reflection on, on the racial situation in this country adapted through a Pulp Fiction story because I like this kind of fiction and I want it to be published by a Bangkok-based publisher called Cranway Press, owned by my, my friend Tom Butter, who turned down the book at first because it was not good for his standard, but that's fine. And that's why I wrote a fiction story with, with, with the crime overtone, and then I set it in Penang because Penang is a very overlooked place in Malaysia. Everyone writes about KL, 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 or they write about colonial Malaya, which is honestly very boring. I mean, when I read um, Tantuan Neng, those kind of things, oh my God, man, so boring, actually. Fucking boring. Malaysia is, uh, is a very vibrant country with a very vibrant modernity, with serious problems, and not just uh, ethnic, uh, relationship and stuff, there's a lot going on in this country that can be fictionalized and make for great li li uh, literature. And essentially, when you write a novel, differently from academic books and stuff, even if you talk about the same topic, you want to expose something, novels, for some reason, they work better. If you think of any novel, like, I don't know, uh, A Catcher in the Rye, whatever, they kind of like paint uh, a social situation in a particular period, in a particular history of a particular country. No academic book can do that. And uh, there's no impact uh, at large in uh, popular culture. So I was very disappointed that only foreigners who picked up the book said that the book is great because it's it's not a perfect story maybe. There may be some flaws, my first novel, whatever. But they say that it's fresh, it's a good idea and it's challenging because it challenges you to think. But no Malaysians came to me to tell me the same word. So it's either Malaysian brain works in a different way or I don't know what's going on because it's clear that when you read this book, you want to denounce racism and uh, denounce a situation which brings these different groups to be strongly kind of against each other. That, 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 there was a review by this guy that tells me that the book uh, is not good because for 40,000 ringgit, people will not kill. So my answer to this guy is, uh, you probably don't know that this book, uh, first of all, is a look into the world of micro criminality. So it's not the big figure. These guys are, these guys are being screwed from day one, from page one, by every character in the book. And uh, this is just to show that people with this ideology, they just can be stupid. And so they will be used by everyone. Okay, so at the same time, 40,000 is the money that an immigrant Nigerian work uh, criminal is trying to get back for himself. And if you are a Nigerian immigrant criminal, 40,000 is a lot of money. And plus, they don't want to kill anybody. They just want to get his money back. And then things get, get screwed in the middle, you know? It's, it's, it's a crime story. You, you need to get the reader, the hint to, to con, con, continue. But if you don't get the main core of my story, which is the denounce racism, so it's either you have a serious mental problem or you, you need to read the book again. Because it's that at the beginning, these guys are drinking beer in front of a mosque, criticizing what's going on in the mosque. So you have to understand that they are Muslims and they, they, they end up dealing drugs. But if you are a Muslim, you do not do that if you are a good Muslim. So there is a constant shifting of uh, responsibilities to show 
that these are the malaise that we have uh, in this country you know so if you don't understand that i mean maybe yes i understand why amno is still in power after 60 years and he was banned but the funny thing is that he was banned in english after two years and a half uh, and he and it's been reviewed in every major mainstream N newspaper, the yeah. Star and uh, Malay Mail, whatever. So, if you really want to know and ban this book, you should ban it after a right, month and the they came out. Yeah. But this is the same story of Fifty Shades of Grey. And the funny thing is that I don't know why it was banned because I cannot go and ask, of course. Um, probably, I think, because of the, the title, because there's, a, there's young Malay fanatics, so Malay. Malays think that Malays cannot be fanatic. I think they are. I mean, in ma many of the things they do, especially, I don't know, this wood dude and stuff like that, but whatever. Anyhow, um, I, I just want to say that the banning of the book, uh, which is banned uh, in the list, uh, is banned after the Mammoth Book of Erotica. So. I don't know wh wh what is the ground on banning this book, but I mean, if banning this book gets me into the, tra the tradition of authors like uh, Miller and stuff, uh, I mean, so that, that is great for me, but on the other hand, uh, it means that we don't know why this book has been banned, because if just being porn means like being banned, uh, I don't know if the censors have read this book. <laughs> I'm not sure. But, but, well, anyways, the Maybe funny thing is that a Malay version was published two months before the ban. And the Malay version is still in the shops. It was not affected by the... I don't the know. Directive. I don't know because I have not uh, spoken much with the publisher after the book came out because I am afraid to say, but I had a kind of an issue with them because they wanted to market this book, which is against racism using Nazi symbology. And this really got me very hurt because as a European, I can, cannot understand the, the idiocy of doing that when you want to promote a book which is against racism, racism yeah. and using swastikas. They want to put uh, the it's eagle, the, the Nazi, eagle on the bloody cover of the book yeah whatever so <laughs> i don't know I, I don't care i hope that the malays who read the the book uh, understood what i meant uh, but i really doubt it i understand that uh we you also double as a role as an editor mm -hmm. for some magazine as well as some, some books so mm -hmm. i guess the in sharpened word we would like to know your role as an editor does it help you in any way in improving a skill as a writer? Okay, I'm not really an editor because uh, uh, let's say that my experience is limited. But I have done a little bit for uh, an online magazine that I run myself uh, together with British writer Tom Coote. The magazine was called Wicked World, the, but we had to shut it off because no revenue and stuff. So. It was a pity because it was a travel magazine, really off the beaten and adventure stories from uh, strange places like Comoros Island and all kind of things like that. Well, I think uh, uh, you need to be a good editor of yourself, which means you need to be humble enough to understand when your writing is not good. And uh, many people are not really good in doing this. I mean, what I do personally is when I'm writing, I write because like a sculpture, I'm, I mean, you need to have uh, the, the material there. And if it's in your mind, it's not written down, you cannot edit anything. So you need to make, like Murakami says, the running is like writing and in some ways is right because when you know that you have to run, 40 kilometers like a marathon and you think that there is a book process there's a lot of sweat involved like there's a lot of physical pain there's a lot of knee joint pain stuff like, <laughs> like, like that but this is the process of writing because writing like um, 
it's not uh, sitting at a typewriter and bleed like uh, it's been said but it can be very annoying I hate writing sometimes you feel something in your heart is like ah I need to put this thing down and you need to go on you need to continue you don't need to read if you stop and read it's finished the magic is gone you need to be able to vomit the words down on the paper as best as you can that when you read back you will not be good and this is the starting of your editing so we need to be very good self editors I received sometimes some pieces that were very very good then consider that I'm not an, an native speaker my English luckily I have a flow like I mean some uh, uh, Gareth Richards which who edit my, my se second book Banana Punk, Banana Punk Rock Trace British man he said that my prose has the flow that many even native speakers don't have and I don't know if this becomes because of music my past in in performance or stuff but it's important when you write down something that you conserve an idea that you need to surprise educate but first of all you need to capture your reader so the editing becomes you you need to be like a surgeon you need to cut a lot of things out you need to disassemble and swap things up and down to make it read the best it can because if you lose your reader after the first 10 lines, I mean, it's finished. So you need to capture at first. You, you, you need to start with something that is very strong uh, and uh, it has a hook. Yeah, maybe any book on writing can tell you this. But I mean, if you, if you open a, a book and it's like, I am born on this day and it was a nice uh, day of sun, blah, 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 blah. Fuck it. Um, she opened her legs and I look uh, into her twat and stuff like that. Yeah, you, you, you will be reading because it's porn. Okay, so without doing pornography, you need to excite your reader in s subtle ways. I mean, there are many, in, so many speak. ways to kind of excite. You don't have necessarily to, to have sex immediately. There's a lot of foreplay before. So once you can do, do that, you are a good editor. And many people, I have to say, they are very precious with their prose, but they don't know that if they want to be professional writers, their prose, uh, unless it's, it, it has the flow, will be dissected like a corpse. And this, this hurts people very much because people think that, oh, the editor is touching my prose, so it means that I'm not good and they're better than me. Yes, they are, because they have the, the budget to pay you. So if you want to eat and write, you must get paid, right? So it's important to understand that an editor's job is to make a piece of writing a piece of cake. So if people are very full of themselves, I discourage them from being writers because the way to see a book into printed, published form, it's a calvary of revisions. And if you cannot take those, change. And that's it, eh? That's it. Okay. So one final question for you, Marco. Mm -hmm. So what's your plans going ahead? Okay. Uh, two years ago, more or less, uh, right after I finished Nazi Goreng, I started writing a new book, which is an apocalyptic uh, story. I always wanted to write a book about Satan. I mean, I love the devil in many ways. And uh, it's a book tentative co is a novel tentative called uh, apocalypse loop i had to uh, put it aside because of too many commitments too much writing for magazines and my phd my research and i i want to finish the book actually the book is almost finished but i think now i, I need to change the flow i mean and I, 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 I need to swap a lot of things around and I have two other novels in my mind. One of I will research this summer, I'm, I'm going to the Himalayas in India. It, it will be a story set in India, which is one of my favorite countries in the world. And uh, besides that, I'm continuing uh, writing freelance uh, for magazines. And uh, I want to continue doing so and continue traveling. 
and uh, hopefully be able to balance uh, time for, for writing actually because I need to sit down, and, I mean sitting down and writing a novel is, uh, you can do it anywhere, but you need to have uh, the drive to sit down and complete the first draft as I said, which would be terrible anyway, so mm -hmm. I, I need to get back into it because at the moment um, priority also goes to pitching articles because if I don't pitch I don't write and I don't get paid so I don't eat that's the problem <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it's a vicious circle but hopefully things will be okay so expect to see three new novels or four from me in the next few years because they are in my mind I mean I just need to write Work them down it, yeah. Yeah. make it a reality yeah <laughs> okay, thank you Marco, thank no you problem. Marco for your time, and I hope you all have a very enlightening session with Marco, and I certainly did, and of course we we'll look forward to hearing a lot more good things from Marco, and on behalf of Sharpen Word, Thanks. we wish you every success in your undertaking, thank you very much, and we would love to hear from you, you know, in the future about what you are doing. Okay, sure. Yeah? Okay. There is a website uh, that you can follow, uh, www.monkeyrockworld.com. It will be updated soon. That used to be my blog. Now it's been slow for a while, but I'm planning on writing a bit more about traveling and writing and some tips, uh, sharing some, uh, some insights. We'll see. We'll see what the future brings. So on behalf of Sharpen World, you keep writing. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Arrivederci. Ciao.